That's my board chair. <laughs> Artie Haberman. Thank you. I'm full. Okay. Carrie. With only a two hour lunch break, I found myself faced with a very. Oh. Erase that. With only a two hour lunch break, I found myself faced with a rather daunting task of introducing you to one of our 2018 Vicki Sexual Freedom Award recipients, Carolyn Bettinger Lopez. Is this an alarm? Okay. Now this is our ninth summit, so you would think nothing would be daunting to me when it comes to introducing people. But in this case, I had to figure out how to condense all the wonderfulness of Carrie into a few minutes so that Carrie could actually speak with you for the rest of the time and you could come to know her for yourselves. Carrie is the founding director of the University of Miami Law School. Uh, I'm sorry, University of Miami Law School Human Rights Clinic, where she's a professor of clinical legal education. Before her current position, Carrie was at Columbia Law School with the Human Rights Institute. And she served as acting director of the Human Rights Clinic there. Carrie is also the proud mother of two exhilarating, exhausting, joyful children she shares with her partner, Sean. She lives in Florida and loves to <laughs> stand up paddle. Yeah, in this crowd, I think we'll call it paddle boarding rather than stand up paddle. <laughs> when I asked Carrie if she was a proud Floridian, she said, depends on the day, mostly, no. Carrie served a two-year term in the Obama administration where she served as the White House Advisor on Violence Against Women. She was a senior advisor to Vice President Joe Biden and a member of the White House Council on Women and Girls. During her time in the White House, Carrie co-chaired the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault, and she chaired the U.S. Government Interagency Working Group on Violence Against Women. Co or coordinating the Sexual Assault Kid Initiative and developing the cabinet level North American Working Group on Violence Against Indigenous Women and Girls. Carrie has worked extensively with advocates and government officials in Canada on issues of violence against Indigenous women and girls. She's challenged stand your gun laws before the United Nations and the Inter American Commission on Human Rights and she's collaborated with advocates in Miami and Haiti to stop U.S. deportations to post-earthquake Haiti. There's so much more that I could tell you about Carrie, and so much more you'll want to know, I think, like how Carrie was the lead counsel on the first international human rights case brought by a domestic violence victim against the United States. I'll be sharing more tonight when I have the honor of presenting Carrie with her 2018 Vicki Sexual Freedom Award. And you'll be hearing right now more from Carrie if I could stop talking and sit down. So without further ado, I bring you Carrie Bettinger Lopez. Thank you so much, Ricky. What, what an introduction and uh, what a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm going to put your notes right here. Um, good afternoon. I am uh, just so honored and humbled to be here amongst this incredible group of human rights activists, sexuality educators, researchers, educators, professionals from various fields, medical, legal, otherwise, authors, sexual freedom movement leaders. I feel an immense collective energy in this room, and just looking across this room, I am so inspired by all of you and learning about all that you do. 
all of us working towards this common goal of ensuring that sexual freedom is fully recognized as a fundamental human right. I'm deeply honored also to be presented with the uh, 2018 Vicki Sexual Freedom Award alongside the phenomenal activist Mia Mingus. I'm going to go to my first slide. Let's see. Uh, hmm. Yes, I'm trying. Well, why don't I just do it like that? Okay. This is my uncle Mike. Um, Michael Bettinger, uh, he is, is for me a very important person. I, I just want to take a moment of personal privilege um, to talk about him. I think uh, he's really reflected in um, the spirit of my remarks today and the spirit of this room. Mike is a real pioneer in sexual freedom. He's now a retired psychotherapist in San Francisco. And this is a photo of him and uh, my uncle Bob riding in the Dykes on Bikes parade in San Francisco this year. They give him an honorary slot, or both of them an honorary slot every year. Back in 1974, Uncle Mike founded the Lesbian and Gay Teachers Association of New York, and he thinks he was actually the first person to teach a high school class on civil rights and homosexuality in a public high school in Manhattan. That was in 1975. And so growing up, I learned a tremendous amount about life and love and freedom from my Uncle Mike. And he inspired me, and you all continue to inspire me today. So I just wanted to kind of share that on a personal note. Um, let's see, hold on. Okay. Um, actually, let me just stay there for a minute. So I've been really captivated by the work of the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Foundation and Sister Song um, for uh, really over a decade since I was a human rights lawyer um, at Columbia Law School with the Human Rights Institute and I learned about both organizations. Um, and whether it was pushing my home state of Florida to stop the barbaric practice of shackling pregnant women who are giving birth, which a battle that was won in 2014 and that the Woodhull Sexual Freedom Foundation intervened in and had a prominent role in pushing for. Or whether it's educating Americans about the importance of the 2006 Yogya Karta principles on the application of international human rights in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. How many of you are familiar with the Yogya Karta principles? Okay, several of you. So Woodhull was at the forefront of really educating the U.S. human rights community about that. Um, or Sister Song, Centering Women of Color in Reproductive Health Advocacy. These organizations played a critical role for me as a young human rights attorney and activist and for so many people around me. And you've always, always been on the cutting edge of this intersectional work on gender identity and sexual orientation, health justice, and human rights. Ricky uh, Woodhull's fearless leader, uh, she has led that charge, and she has really taken the helm of expanding freedom and eradicating injustice by centering our bodies and our desires and our personal autonomy. And I just want to remind all of us, gatherings like this summit are so important for reminding us of our spirit, of our principles and our companions on our journeys as activists. They are especially important in the times that we are living in today. We are, both individually and collectively, experiencing an unparalleled moment in our history when hate and fear are driving the federal policies from, uh, well, from this town right here and just across the river when we have a sexual predator-in-chief who occupies the White House. I mean occupy in every sense of the word. And when the most marginal and vulnerable amongst us face growing risks every day. And then in that same scary, bizarre, unprecedented moment, we have the Me Too movement. We have an un movement founded a decade ago. Okay, let's see if I can make this work now. Okay, by Tarana Burke. Uh, black woman from Harlem who thought about Me Too as a way to spur mass healing for sexual violence survivors in underprivileged communities. This movement was reignited last fall, we know, by Hollywood actresses like Alyssa Milano, who's featured in this slide, um, and was then given depth and context by migrant farm workers in an open letter to these Hollywood actresses that was featured in Time magazine um, last November. 
And oops, that, that slide didn't come out so well here. But this is uh, an example of just some of the t many tweets that we are all fami familiar with um, and the social media impressions that we saw um, in, uh, in, the, in the wake of the Me Too mo movement and moment. Okay, so this is a, an impression from a website where 700,000 female farm workers say that they stand with the Hollywood actors uh, against sexual assault. Now, what does that mean to have farm workers saying, we stand with you, right? Um, what, a, what a brilliant move, what a, what a profound moment. And I just want to read from the farm workers, uh, from this open letter that they sent to Alyssa Milano and Ashley Judd and these Hollywood actresses who, who really reignited this Me Too mo movement that, uh, that Tarana Burke had started. They write, we do not work under the bright lights or the big screen. We work in the shadows of society, in isolated fields and packing houses that are out of sight and out of mind for most people in our country. Even though we work in diff difficult environments and different environments, we share a common experience of being preyed upon by individuals who have the power to hire, fire, and blacklist or otherwise threaten our economic physical, and emotional security. Like you, there are few positions available to us, and reporting any kind of harm or injustice committed to us, committed against us, excuse me, doesn't seem like a viable option. And lo and behold, on January 1st of this year, the Hollywood actresses responded in an open letter and the announcement of the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which many of you have heard about, the Hollywood actresses wrote, to every woman employed in agriculture who has had to fend off unwanted sexual advances from her boss, every housekeeper who has tried to escape an assaultive guest, every janitor trapped at nightly in a building with a predatory supervisor, every waitress grabbed by a customer and expected to take it with a smile, every garment and factory worker forced to trade sexual acts for more shifts, every domestic worker or home health aide forcibly touched by a client Every immigrant woman silenced by the threat of her undocumented status being reported in, re excuse me, in retaliation for speaking up, and to women, women in every industry who are subjected to indignities and offensive behavior that you are expected to tolerate in an order to make a living. We stand with you. We support you. We remain committed to holding our own workplaces accountable pushing for swift and effective change to make the entertainment industry a safe and equitable place for everyone, telling stories through our eyes and voice with the goal of shifting our society's perception and treatment of women. And may I add, of course, and many of you are probably thinking, the gender identity sexual orientation piece has largely been missing from that conversation. We need to continue to push for it to be infused in that Me Too conversation the us two conversation that has happened this week with the Ohio State uh, wrestling uh, you know, issue uh, has, has really brought us two to the fore. We've seen kind of pieces uh, that have been featured about male sexual violence on men. We've seen pieces that have focused on LGBTQ sexual violence, uh, but those have not featured prominently enough in the Me Too movement, in my opinion. Many argue that Me Too would not and could not have happened if not for Donald Trump's record of sexual violence against women. And that may be true, but I'll take the silver lining. And we all know what that silver lining was, the protest marches that we've seen over the past year and a half. The, uh, sorry about the format here, um, but the, um, you know, o o hundreds of thousands of people marching in, uh, in cities across the country. And many argue that, uh, excuse me, and, and, and the, the feminist icon and scholar Catherine McKinnon, uh, she has characterized Me Too as the zenith of a decades-old movement that is combating sexual harassment, largely through the law. But Me Too, she argues, represents a turn away from the law, a turn away from expecting legal institutions to do all the hard work. Instead, victims and survivors and friends and allies, they are achieving change through public shaming, through social media, through movement building, as well as through lawsuits. 
But Me Too, she argues, is eroding the two biggest barriers to ending sexual harassment in law and in life. First of all, the disbelief of victims. And second of all, the trivializing dehumanization of victims. Complaints are routinely passed off with some version of she wasn't credible, or she wanted it, or he can't be a real victim. And even when the victim was believed, the consequences for the usually high profile male perpetrator are often prioritized over the harm that is done to the victim. It could end his career, it could be life shattering, but what about the survivor? And so um, just to kind of wrap up with Catherine McKinnon, because I think she gives a very powerful framework for thinking about this, she says that it's widely thought that when something is legally pro prohibited, it more or less stops. And as lawyers, we often kind of grapple with this. Why is it that when something is legally prohibited, it, it sometimes doesn't stop? She says, it may be true for exceptional acts, for things that are beyond the pale, but it's not true for things that are pervasive practices, things that are so ingrained in our everyday life, things like sexual harassment, including rape, or things like racial discrimination, nominally illegal, but still widely practiced. And so only if survivors stand up and challenge the status quo of structural misogyny and if we all call out rape culture, as my former boss, Joe Biden, used to talk about, well then, only then, and, and if powerful people pay attention, can things change. I want to tell you a story about my client, Jessica Lenahan, um, who has become really transformed, and she describes her own pro process of transformation from victim to client to survivor to activist. And I want to talk about Jessica and that own process of transformation for her and what it means for survivor-led advocacy. I think her story uh, is one of the most powerful stories I've ever heard in my life, um, and she continues to inspire me. So uh, Ricky mentioned Jessica. I've had the privilege of representing her and working with her for over 14 years. Um, her tragic story uh, comes from Castle Rock, Colorado. In 1999, her three children, her three daughters, were kidnapped by her estranged husband after uh, she had obtained a restraining order against him from a Colorado court. The restraining order prohibited him from having contact with Jessica or the children, and he came to the house one day and kidnapped the three daughters in violation of the order. She called the police nine times. She had nine points of contact with the police over a nearly 10-hour period. She even told them where they were at one point. She knew they were at an amusement park in Denver, and the police responded, well, that's outside of our jurisdiction. There's nothing we could do. And ironic that the Amber Alert came up right before I came on to speak, because this was before the days of Amber Alerts, and, uh, and which shows that some progress has been made. But there was no alert given. There was no call even to the Denver Police Department, 40 miles away from Castle Rock. At 3 o'clock in the morning, Simon Gonzalez, her estranged husband, showed up at the Castle Rock Police Station with a gun he purchased that evening falling through all of the FBI background checks that should have prohibited him from purchasing that gun. He opened fire on the police station. The police shot and killed him and found the bodies of the three girls dead inside his truck. She sued the police, claiming that they had violated her constitutional rights. After all, she had a restraining order. She did everything she was supposed to do. She called the police when the restraining order was violated. She called back. She called back. She went in person. She persisted, and yet the door was continually slammed in her face. And, uh, and, and she said, well, my due process rights were violated. After all, aren't I entitled to a response if I went through this whole process of getting the order that's supposed to protect me? And her case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And tragically, in 2005, the Supreme Court found that she had no constitutional right to have her restraining order enforced. They found that this wasn't a matter of the federal constitution, that she should go back to state court, they said. But Colorado State Court was closed to her because they have many state laws have very high levels for overcoming what's called governmental immunity, meaning you can't sue the police because the police have to have so-called discretion to do their jobs. So she was left with no remedy. 
And I represented Jessica uh, when I was at the ACLU Wom Women's Rights Project as a young lawyer there. And I represented not Jessica, but I represented what's called amiki, which are friends of the court who submit briefs to the Supreme Court saying, we support her. We think her issues are relevant to us. And the we was 150 different groups that represented a diverse array of perspectives. Everybody from children's rights and elder rights groups to domestic violence advocates to police organizations who all said, this is really screwed up. This can't stand the, the lower court rulings and we need to have the Supreme Court fix it, which of course they didn't. Um, I wanted to stop for a moment and mention that usually when I talk about this case, um, I, I, used, I used to before a month ago, pause right here and compare U.S. constitutional law with U.S. asylum law because in the past, before this crazy moment that we're in, uh, U.S. asylum law actually gave the possibility of asylum to domestic violence seekers from other countries who claimed that they could not get protection in their home countries and so they could apply to the U.S. for asylum claiming that they were at risk in their own countries because their police forces did not protect them. And I always pointed out the irony of the fact that U.S. asylum law perhaps gave broader rights to domestic violence survivors from other countries than it gave to our own citizens and residents here in the United States. Now, a month ago that all changed when Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued an insane uh, order that basically overruled that entire precedent. And so now we're living in this moment uh, when he's now rolled back uh, our asylum law to the same place that our constitution, our federal constitutional law is at. So we've made a major step backward for immigrant survivors who, are, who have sought asylum in our country. And we have to just continue to fight this. I'm gonna talk a little bit about ways that we have been fighting it. So, um, so we, exhaust, we, we went all the way up to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court. We lost. So what did we do? Well, the lawyers <laughs> were like, oh, it's the Supreme Court, highest court in the land, end of the road. But it was Jessica and her mother who said, no, something else must be done. We must find a way to, uh, to seek justice. And they persisted and they pushed their lawyers. And this is important. This is part for me of, of what drives me and to go to work every day to do this work is that survivors leading the charge, survivors pushing lawyers, pushing others to, to think outside the box. And so we said, well, there's no other place we can go in terms of a court in the US, but we could go to the international community and call out the United States government. What do you think about that? And, uh, and so kind of, you know, in the spirit of, of Ricky's uh, introduction of the FOSTA lawsuit, it felt pretty good when we filed Jessica Lenahan versus United States before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. This is a photo of uh, the hearing before the commission um, that we had. We had a series of hearings. Th these hearings provided such a moment for Jessica in so many different ways. This effectively was her day in court. She was denied a day in court through the U.S. court system. Her case went to the U.S. Supreme Court on what's called a motion to dismiss, which is legalese for it's a question of law. She never even got a trial. She never got any evidentiary hearings. She never got to know the truth of how, when, and where her daughters died. And through the Inter-American Commission process, she had a voice. And that was something that was denied to her by our own U.S. justice system. We alleged uh, before the Inter-American Commission um, that, I'll, tell, I'll go there in a minute, we alleged that the United States was responsible for human rights violations. I wanna pause for a moment just to explain what the Inter-American Human Rights System is. I promise I won't spend long because this is like me going into professor mode here. Bear with me, okay? Here we've got a map of the Americas. The Organization of American States is the political body that's responsible for overseeing a lot of different issues in the Americas, including the human rights situation in the Americas. Um, and the Organization of American States is, is headquartered right here in Washington, D.C. So check it out. It's a gorgeous building over on Constitution Avenue. Um, and, uh, and it was founded in 1948. It's, the, uh, it's composed of the 35 independent nations of the Americas. And it's the world's oldest regional institution. Pretty, pretty interesting stuff, right? Even for the nerdy law professor. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so we we alleged that Jessica, we alleged several human rights violations. 
And in 2011, that was back in 2006, we filed. In 2011, we got a decision, which is actually in human rights world, lightning speed, okay? So in 2011, we get this decision from the Organization of American States, really from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is a part of the OAS, uh, which finds that Jessica's and her children's rights to life have been violated. That's Article 1. Article 2, uh, equal protection and non-discrimination. This is, this is all from a, a major treaty or a, a major human rights instrument in the inter-American system. So rights to equal protection and non-discrimination have been violated. The rights to special protections for the children have been violated, and due process protections have been violated. So the complete opposite of what the U.S. Supreme Court says. And look at this language. I think this language is extremely powerful, and it's been picked up, I'll talk about it in a moment, in other parts of the world. Um, the, uh, the commission says that a state's failure, by a state they mean the country, the country's failure to act with due diligence to protect women from violence constitutes a form of discrimination, equating freedom from violence and, dis and non-discrimination. That's landmark, that's really important. Um, and denies women their right to equality before the law. And look at this intersectional language, that certain groups of women are at particular risk for acts of violence due to previous discrimination. Amongst these are girl children, that's the international speak, of course, for girls, um, or women pertaining to ethnic, racial, and minority groups. Uh, so the commission was really getting there at Jessica, a Latina and Native American woman, who was working class in an upper middle class white town of Castle Rock, Colorado. What were the intersectional layers going on there that may have informed the police response? The commission implored the United States to require, uh, uh, to adopt measures to modify the social and cultural patterns of conduct of men and women and to eliminate prejudices, customary practices, uh, based on these notions of inferiority uh, or superiority of either of the sexes or on stereotyped roles for men and women. And this is really remarkable language um, that, that, that really can drive policy. Well, that's what we thought. We thought, okay, let's get it to drive policy. Um, and sorry about, okay. Uh, I'll get to that. I'll get to the next slide in a moment. Um, what I want to talk about is what we did with this. Okay, we have this amazing language from this decision, but everyone asks in the human rights world, uh, well, great language, aspirational principles. How do we turn those into action? So I want to just spend the next few minutes talking about how we turned this into action. Really, again, being driven by Jessica the entire time. The first thing we did, and I'm sorry that this is not going to show up very well, um, but the first thing that we did was think about local, the local. And I really want to like Im implore all of you right now to be thinking locally because while I came from the federal government, the federal government is not a place that we're going to be seeking change right now, right? So if we can be thinking locally and acting locally, we can really achieve change. We thought about the idea of creating resolutions um, that, uh, that declared that freedom from domestic violence is a fundamental human right. And at this point, over 30 municipalities across the country have adopted these resolutions. If any of you are from cities or towns or states that you think this might be interesting in, interesting for, we'd love to, I'd love to talk to you more, and Ricky has been really supportive of, of this initiative as well. So again, getting your municipality to make a declaration of something is the first step towards concrete policy action. Um, and, oh goodness, I'm so sorry about this. Uh, okay. Um, the second thing that happened, and this is at the federal level, this was under the Obama administration, um, which, where we saw tremendous progress, though not enough, uh, but tremendous progress on this issue. The other thing that happened at the federal level was that DOJ, the Department of Justice, began investigating police departments for gender bias. And so you started seeing these really interesting moments where, for example, uh, the New Orleans Police Department was investigated uh, for arresting trans sex workers uh, in, you know, with, with absolutely no basis. Um, or the Puerto Rico Police Department had 92 
uh, officers employed on the police force who had been uh, uh, arrested for domestic violence and nothing had happened. Um, and so by taking this, this kind of activist moment, um, the, the DOJ really was able to start to name something called gender bias in policing. And I just want to kind of go through that um, uh, of what happened. Organizations then started picking up on that. And the National Domestic Violence Hotline conducted a study. And they found that tremendous numbers of domestic violence victims um, were not calling the police, first of all. So they did a study. About 50% of their callers uh, had called the police uh, to report domestic violence. The other 50% had not even called the police. That's important to know, right, for when we kind of over rely on our criminal justice system as the be all end all for addressing uh, gender violence. And then secondly, of the 50% who had called the police, uh, only one in seven said they would call again. So that's a terrible customer service uh, uh, you know, response, right? So, um, so what ended up happening is that, let me just skip ahead here, is that advocates put pressure on the Department of Justice and said, you're, you're doing these great civil rights investigations. We have data that's really showing that there's a problem of law enforcement response to domestic violence and sexual assault. Myself, in my prior life as, a, as an advocate working on behalf of Jessica Lenahan, had been pushing for the idea of getting the, de the Department of Justice to issue something called guidance on gender bias and policing. And then when I was in the White House, I was able to kind of watch that move along, and it was just fabulous the way the Department of Justice kind of took this on. Um, this is about kind of implementing real concrete policy advocacy as a result of survivor-led activism. And, uh, and there are eight principles in the guidance. I don't want to go into them in great detail, but they're very, I, I think they're very informative for a group um, like, like this today, uh, because these eight principles really talk about and implore police departments to recognize biases and address stereotypes, to treat victims with tra in a trauma-informed and respectful way, um, to investigate thoroughly and effectively, uh, to hold officers who commit domestic violence and sexual assault accountable, um, and to collect data. These are huge gaps in our work, um, and they sound kind of dry, but through your workshops and through the themes you're going to be covering today, I guarantee you that each of these principles are going to be covered in the entire summit uh, because these principles on their face seem kind of duh, they seem kind of obvious, um, but in practice we know in our work, whether it's with police departments or other organizations, that we don't see enough of this. Um, I want to just kind of give a shout out to my previous colleague, Chris Rose, uh, who was at the Department of Justice and interned uh, excuse me, a detailed, de uh, detailed with us at the White House. Uh, Chris came over and brought her uh, tremendous knowledge and expertise from the Department of Justice. And through Chris's expertise and through Chris's initiative and vision, um, eventually the Department of Justice uh, gave $10 million in grants. Um, and so again, this is about, I'm trying to tell a story of kind of a survivor's vision moving into, uh, into advocacy and activism, moving into concrete policy change, and then forcing the government to put its money where its mouth is. And, um, and these are all really important steps, I think, along the journey um, towards change. Um, and so Chris and I were, we're, uh, well, sometimes we call ourselves partners in crime um, in, in, in those wonderful moments uh, in the previous administration. Um, and I'm really excited that I, I have now embarked um, with uh, one of our previous colleagues and with Chris on, uh, on a new project called the Courage in Policing Project. Um, this is about, this is, Courage is an acronym that stands for Community Oriented and United Responses to Address Gender Violence and Equality. Courage is all about at the local level and at the national level, getting the groups, LGBT equality groups, sanctuary city advocates, Black Lives Matter advocates, groups that are involved in advocacy at the community level to inform domestic, the domestic violence advocacy community about the experiences of the most marginalized survivors, and then vice versa, stimulating conversations across communities, breaking down our silos, 
and then working with police departments at the local level to actually affect concrete policy change. This is a, just a, um, a Venn diagram that I created to kind of depict courage, right? So you've got domestic violence and sexual assault organizations, you've got what I call marginalized communities organizations, and then law enforcement, all kind of different pieces of, of this larger puzzle. Okay. Um, the last thing I just want to end on is kind of the way in which we tell stories, because I think Jessica's story is incredibly powerful, and, and I think about her every day in my own quest to uh, fight for justice on behalf of survivors. A new documentary called Home Truth has come out about Jessica. Um, if any of you are interested in viewing it, a couple ways you can. The first is that it's premiering on PBS in the next couple of months. Um, so check it out on your local PBS station. Um, and second of all, Jessica uh, it frequently will come and, and um, speak and at film screenings, right? So you can bring a f the film to your community. Screen it at your university, in your local community, um, community center, et cetera. Um, and this is the story of Jessica's life. It's a, it's a story about Jessica that centers on Jessica and the effect on her family. I mean, the, the Bingo Family Matters uh, card really hit home for me because it's so important to kind of center the, your, your role and your family in your larger quest for justice. Um, and, uh, and so Jessica, um, her quest for justice is featured alongside her own kind of personal journey in this film. Uh, so I think that Jessica's case can really serve as an inspiration and guidance for all of us as we forge ahead in this very uncertain moment. Um, I think that together, we as human rights activists, we can shake things up, we can throw a boomerang or two into the ether, uh, as she did, threw that boomerang out, sought the power of the international community and brought it right back home to shake things up and make a change in her own community. Um, and we can all work together in the spirit of human rights and fight for this right to be free from gender violence for all. So I want to implore all of you, obviously I don't need to say this, but I think we always need to say this. We're less than 100 days away from voting day in November. Everybody remember about the importance of getting out and voting, about getting your communities out to vote, about bringing in 20 new people in your life who may not have turned up at the ballot box that day and getting them to show up. Because if we don't show up and we don't stand up, we'll never create the change that we seek. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And uh, I look forward to the award ceremony tonight. I look forward to getting to know many of you and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Does anyone have a question? If you'll stay behind the camera, that way you won't be captured on the camera. Does anyone have a question? Hi, thanks for your amazing work and for Jessica's amazing work. Hi. We're, oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> um, could you comment a little on Betsy DeVos's new new uh, attitude or comments or statements about sexual violence on campuses. Seems like she's taken the whole thing back, oh, at least 50 years. So can you comment on that, how that happened and what we can do about that? Yeah, um, that's a, is the mic on? Okay. Um, that's a great question. Um, as Vicki mentioned, I did co-chair the White House Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault. Um, so Chris and I were deeply involved in the issue of campus sexual assault um, when we were in the White House and uh, Chris's work at DOJ. Um, yeah, I mean, activists, of course, brought us, uh, brought, brought the issue of sexual assault on college campuses and in educational environments to, um, to the federal government. Uh, and demanded action, and the federal government um, under the previous administration, as I'm sure you know and many others know, issued guidance um, and uh, did a lot of work to beef up and hold, beef up 
requirements under Title IX, the federal law, um, requiring that schools respond meaningfully to complaints of sexual violence, um, and, uh, and, and, and that the federal government, through the Department of Education and the Department of Justice, were holding those schools accountable by bringing lawsuits, by, uh, by, by conducting investigations. Betsy DeVos, as you mentioned, um, rescinded that guidance last year and uh, has, um, has basically methodically rolled back everything that, uh, that tens or hundreds of thousands of people across this country demanded um, that, that happen. Uh, and, and so as a result, we now have um, uh, new, new standards um, that send a message that uh, sexual violence, number one, is not a priority of the federal government, and number two, uh, that perpetrators deserve increased protections and victims deserve fewer protections. Um, there's been, uh, it's all been couched in uh, the language of due process, uh, which of course is a very important principle, which I, uh, I, I hold dearly, uh, as my previous presentation just made clear. Um, but it's all, uh, it's all a show, right? It's all a veneer. So what can be done? Well, a few things. Um, in kind of the spirit of acting locally, I believe that now um, there's some engagement that, that needs to continue to happen with the federal government, uh, where advocacy groups, especially those who are uh, kind of sophisticated in the ways of Washington, engage with DeVos to do as much damage control as possible, prevent her from kind of going in as crazy a direction as possible. But, um, but really, where the hard work is going to happen is, when, is, is at the school level and at the state level. Um, so going to local, to local legislators, state legislators, public university systems, private universities, holding them accountable through any state or local legislative means, speaking with their general counsels and other officials, to speaking with their students, making sure students are demanding of their own universities uh, what they need to, um, and, uh, and keeping the movement alive. And activists are continuing to do that. Those amazing students who kindled that entire movement are now moving on and, and kind of forming a shadow government. Basically, we need to form shadow governments and shadow systems of accountability. And whether that's naming and shaming, whether it's Time's Up, whether it's Me Too, um, we need to find other ways of holding schools accountable and making sure that they don't roll back the clock 50 years like the federal government has. Any other questions? My name is Bo. Um, I have. I'm a advocate for the kink and leather communities, and I wanted to see if you have any intake on how I could go about um, changing what my state's laws are about the kink and leather communities. I live in Nevada, and in Nevada, BDSM is illegal. Um, due to not, uh, you cannot legally consent to being abused, um, which puts a lot of people at risk for going to jail, going to prison for domestic violence when uh, it is completely consensual between the two adults. Um, I wanted to go, I wanted to see what your thoughts are about how I can go about to change that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think these are the questions that are really at the cutting edge of, of our dialogue and why summits like this are so important. Um, I, a human rights framework um, really starts with the question of the consent of uh, any individual who's involved, right? And, um, and that's always the perspective that we started with um, in, our, in our work at the White House and that I start with as a human rights lawyer. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, having having a really well thought out and, uh, a, 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 a st statement of principles that's grounded in as many kind of either legal principles um, or moral principles as you can. And then working, I mean, this is such a difficult issue, right? It's, uh, you're going to find very few 
political supporters. Um, and so to the extent that you can find, uh, you really need to kind of work up the justification and the consent piece, right? And kind of differentiate this from, from violence in your viewpoint, right? Um, and you, I, I mean, I may be guilty of sounding like a lawyer here and, and thinking too much like a lawyer, but given that you're thinking about kind of the le legislative and legal framework, you need to work as cl closely with lawyers as possible to come up with a legal analysis, I think, that can really kind of legally differentiate it from an abuse framework that is illegal under state law. And then it's, it's very much about tiny incremental advocacy. I'm sure you're deeply engaged in this, so I, I'm probably not telling you anything you're not already doing, uh, but, but kind of working incrementally, um, finding allies, even finding allies where you have like a teeny wedge. Maybe you don't have somebody who's fully bought in. I've always found that that's the most effective way to, uh, to kind of make change in some of the hardest areas. So I don't know if that's helpful. I don't know, Ricky, if you have anything else to add on that. No, not right now. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet we will later. Uh, yes, Tom. Hi. I've, I've read some of the, uh, not just this organization, but other international organizations' decisions on family law. And it's always amazed me how some countries actually take this stuff seriously. Mm -hmm. And I know in the United States, you had to push to get any of this stuff done. It, had to, it was sort of a weight on your side, but you didn't really count on anybody in the government doing anything. And I was wondering if you could just comment on uh, how other countries respond as opposed to how we respond, because it seems to me that it's a completely different thing. Yeah, um, great question. So I think it depends on the country, it depends on the issue and the context. Uh, so other countries do take the decisions of international human rights bodies much more seriously from a legal perspective than we do. Uh, so this, the Constitutional Court of Columbia, for example, will take a decision from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and literally implement it as if it was a constitutional court decision. Um, it has the same weight as domestic court decisions. Um, same thing in Argentina, same thing in many other countries. Uh, for that matter, the Constitutional Court of Kenya cited to the Jessica Lenahan case actually, finding in a case uh, where police officers uh, did not respond to the rampant issue of rape of young girls, um, that that was a violation of the Kenyan constitution. But they relied on international precedent, they relied on this inter in our case to help justify um, that Kenyan constitutional decision. Um, so we have many examples of countries around the world um, that are relying on international law in a much more uh, strict and uh, faithful way than the United States. But that doesn't mean that it actually translates to change on the ground. Um, it, sometimes it does. If, and, and kind of back to Catherine McKinnon's point, sometimes if it's kind of an easy legal issue, if a change in the law can kind of easily change behavior, um, then you can see an immediate change. If, for example, in, in Colombia, the Constitutional Court um, uh, changed its perspective on women's uh, right to an abortion and found that, I believe, in cases of uh, risk of, of life or health to the mother, it permitted abortion, right? That was a huge change in, in Colombian law. Um, and in that case, uh, in many instances, uh, you know, doctors had to kind of change or hospitals had to change their policies. Um, I'm not saying it was a perfect uh, transition, but, but it was a much more easy pivot than changes in attitudes and behaviors, um, biases and stereotypes uh, of this sort. Um, and, so, uh, and so, you know, sometimes we talk about kind of when law gets implemented in a direct way, we think it's uh, a game changer. But even in our own country, we have enforcement mechanisms. Brown versus Board of Education, right? We all know that case, the landmark case that ended school segregation in this country. Right, like we don't have school segregation in this country, right? That case happened in the 1950s. So I, I always like to remind people that um, even in our own country where we have enforcement mechanisms for domestic law or even in the international context where we have enforcement mechanisms for international law, it doesn't result in a sea change in our in our culture and in our practices um, necessarily overnight, right? And, and so it's a great question. Um, I'll just mention in Chile right now, uh, many of you may have heard, student activists are leading the charge 
they're walking around dressed like handmaids, okay? And I mean, it's amazing, right? I mean, they are walking around dressing like handmaids and demanding that their country and especially their universities do more to respond to sexual violence in the educational context. That's huge. And it's because of those people. It's because of those images that are being blared on Chilean TV every night and on international news. I think it's just as much, if not more, because of those individuals that we're going to hopefully see some change in Chilean practice as it is you know, with, with a kind of a strict adherence to Chilean you know, legal system or the Chilean for, uh, uh, relationship to the international community. Thank you. So this is going to end the lunch program. I do want to thank our two interpreters. Thank you. I want to remind you to join us this evening at 8 o'clock after a wonderful afternoon of workshops. There will be champagne, and there will be more carry. <laughs> That may scare Put that some people in whatever off. order you want. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, Carrie. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.